pleasurable feelings, painful feelings, equanimous feelings. So those are typically available. Now, how are we typically look at them? Say, pleasurable feelings. So whenever we encounter a pleasurable feeling, so we really like it, we want it, I want to have it, I want to have it for a long time, next day also I want it. So you are attached to it, you are desiring it, you are embracing it. So that is the typical approach. So I become elated with it. I am delighted with it whenever a pleasurable feeling is available. So even that is enough for certain defilements to arise. Say a pleasurable feeling is there, but our approach, how you are looking at it, what we do onto that pleasurable feeling, even that is enough for certain defilements to grow. So that's the bad side. Say you are holding it, you are desiring it, then the craving is further increasing, you will want it, desires are further increasing. So sometimes what we call as the raga anusaya is increasing. Raga anusaya. Certain latent tendencies in our mind is further being aggravated. Because of our way of looking at these pleasurable feelings as something necessary, something I want, I like it, so you delight with it. So that promotes certain tendencies in our mind. On the other hand, uh, how about the painful feelings? I don't want it. I want to get rid of it. Why it happened to me? So all others are pretty good, but it happened to me. So we always hate the painful feelings. So hating. So hating leads to another category of defilements, what we call as the patiga anusaya. So another latent tendency is there in the mind, which is always rejecting things, hating things, trying to get rid of things, the anger side. So whenever we go through certain painful feelings, so if we are facing it with this kind of an attitude, that attitude itself is enough to develop these tendencies in the mind. On the other hand, how about the equanimous feelings? We typically don't even notice them. <laughs> we don't even notice them. Because we are typically in the two extremes. Either in the pleasurable side, enjoying that, embracing that, delighted with it. Or we want to get rid of the other painful feelings, not being aware of the equanimous feelings at all. So the not knowing of ignorance or not knowing of pain, uh, equanimous feelings can lead towards the ignorance. What we call as the avijjanuse. So this is the typical way of how we approach the feelings. We want pleasure, we like pleasures, and we are going after various pleasures, and whenever we go through a certain pleasure, I want to have it, I want to embrace it, I like it, I am getting delighted with it. So that is the approach. Whenever we are going through certain painful feelings, I don't want it, I want to get rid of it. When I am going to have pleasures, so always I am looking forward for pleasures when I am going through painful feelings or even equanimous feelings. So this is what we know. This is the typical vocabulary of a non-practitioner, we can say. But in the Vedranupassana, the approach is to recognize, okay, this is a pleasurable feeling. This is a painful feeling. This is a equanimous feeling. Now, if I link this with the typical Kayanupasana practice, say Vitanapanasati, now we know how to look at in breath. We all know how to look at out breath. Okay, there is an in breath, there is an out breath. So, what is the difference between I am breathing, this is my in breath, this is my out breath, versus there is in breath, there is out breath? What's the difference? So there's a significant difference there. So you are not interfering in the experience, you are not trying to make it mine. You like to keep it there. So you have an approach, a kind of a perspective. You let the experience be there, let it happen as it is, as it wants, and you like an outsider. 
you can observe it. Okay, you keep the body to allow the body to naturally breathe, and you, like a silent observer, external observer, you can observe it. There is in breath. There is out breath. Can we apply that same principle to the feelings? So that is the technique that we are going to make use of. So there is a pleasurable feeling. There is a painful feeling. There is an equanimous feeling. Now this is actually a kind of a lesson that we are learning throughout the Satipatthana practice. Now if I take you to a little bit about the Four Noble Truths, how Buddha defines Four Noble Truths? Idang dukkhang arya satchang. Idang dukkhang arya satchang. There is suffering. Isn't it? It is not that I am suffering, I am aging, I am crying, I am worried. Not like that. Okay, there is suffering. So it's a kind of a looking at it from a different angle, from a different point of view. So throughout the Satipatthana, we are learning this practically. So this approach practically. So there is in-breath, there is out-breath. And similarly, even in the walking, say, there is sensations on, say, in the right foot. There is sensations on the left foot. There are movements. There are vibrations. It is not that I am moving, I am this and that. At the beginning, we might have that kind of an attitude, but slowly, slowly, we allow things to happen naturally, as much as possible. That's why the natural movement is quite... Uh, appreciated. Not that we are trying to manipulate things, we are not trying to control the thing. Rather, we allow the body to naturally walk with whatever the way it likes. We allow the body to naturally breathe whatever the way it likes. So similarly, suppose now you have a certain amount of concentration already developed. Maybe using anapanasati, doesn't matter. And uh, when the body is going through a certain amount of pain, now, can you pay your attention to that pain? So that is something that we might have to train the mind. Because typically, we can't exactly, precisely locate that pain. We might lose the aim. But as we discussed already, when we are developing walking meditation, we are, this is a kind of a skill that we are developing. So how to locate the attention, how to properly position the attention. So if you have developed that kind of a skill, now you can easily apply that during Vedana Anupasana, during the establishment of mindfulness through feelings. So different places, our throughout the body, at different places, feelings can arise. And do you know exactly when they are going to arise? <laughs> you can't predict, right? You don't know which category of feeling next it's going to happen that you can't predict, you can't have a schedule, okay, at this particular time the painful feelings have to arise, at this particular time the pressurable feelings have to arise, at this particular time equanimous feelings have to arise. Can you have a, such kind of a schedule? <laughs> so, so the feelings follow their own accord, right, their own agenda. They have their own maybe schedule, I don't know. But you have no control at all. In one sense, what are they teaching us? So we can't, in a way, govern these feelings. So assume that there is a pleasurable feeling arise. You may like it. You may want to keep it for a long time. Can you really keep it as you want? So that is also not possible. Even though you like a certain pleasurable feeling, but sometimes you can't even produce it. Suppose there's a painful feeling and you want to quickly, you know, get rid of it, but it remains, it doesn't go away. So this is a kind of a lesson in a way. So if you understand from that angle, so this is the non-self what we are experiencing. So the painful feelings, they come, they arise due to certain reasons, due to causes. And I might have very less impact or kind of an influence to those reasons, to those causes. So I have, maybe you can take a painkiller or whatever, or change the posture, you can try. 
but rather than doing that if you can understand okay they are telling some kind of a teaching they are trying to teach me a lesson so they are arising okay i can carefully observe them but they don't behave the way i want there is no agreement between myself and the feelings i can't make a, such an agreement so the idea is so you are more and more being kind of accepting whatever the feeling okay let the painful feeling happen i am ready to accept it i am ready to observe it okay let the pleasurable feeling happen okay let it be let me observe it let the equanimous feeling happen okay let me observe it so you are having a kind of an acceptive or receptive attitude so your our mind attitude has to be little changed rather than always trying to change the way we want okay now we step back and allow naturally the different types of feelings to occur as they want so typical our attitude is we are trying to manipulate the thing right we want to control it so rather than doing that okay let the feelings happen the, the way they want so i am ready to observe it i am going to learn from it so assume now there are pleasurable feelings okay assume now you have this kind of a attitude now there are pleasurable feelings it is not that i want it i like it or i delighted with it rather you can step back even when the body is going through pleasurable feelings you can step back not holding it not attached to it rather you can even step back and look at oh this is a pleasurable feeling similarly say painful feeling rather than immediately change in the posture or hate it you can again step back ah there is a painful feeling and rather than ignoring and wishing a pleasurable feeling when we are going through an equanimous feeling ah there is an equanimous feeling so like that so i have to have a kind of an attitude okay whatever the type of feeling going to arise okay i am ready to observe it i am going to learn from it so if we are able to do that then slowly slowly we get the capacity to learn get the capacity to observe different kinds of feelings and you know that buddha has given a very beautiful simile and he say okay in the sky different kinds of winds happen sometimes maybe through the kind of sand sandy type of winds maybe cool winds maybe hot winds maybe you know circulating type of winds different categories of winds are happening similarly buddha mentioned this body is like that this body is subject to different kinds of feelings sometimes pleasurable feelings sometimes painful feelings sometimes equanimous feelings so almost like non governable and when we start watching it when we start observing it slowly slowly we practically understand i can't control it they are happening i simply can observe them and i can maintain a proper attitude so that i am not suffering as i just mentioned so whenever a painful feeling is there rather than adding a mental pain to it so let me observe it keeping the bodily pain just to the bodily pain that's another interesting sutta probably you already have heard about it the salla sutta where buddha mention okay a painful feeling is like a you know you are hitting or you are hit by a dart <laughs> so you are when you are hit by a dart assume that you are hitting yourself by another dart to the same place what do you think about it it would be so painful so the same place when you are hitting it it will be so painful so similarly buddha mentioned the uninstructed person whenever there is a bodily pain so he adds a mental pain on top of that by making a self why it is happening to me why poor me it's always happening to me see all the others are you know really beautiful and they are serene they may be in jahana i am suffering i am i am going through all this pain so you are you know pre- preparing a self created suffering so this self created suffering is something that we can stop so that is something that we have to learn in a way so whenever there is a bodily pain is it possible to keep the bodily pain just to the bodily pain without adding my part without adding a mental part 
and some of you are getting older, even myself. Now, one time, uh, one old gentleman, his name uh, Nakula Pitu, Nakula's father, he has a son called Nakula and his name is therefore Nakula Pitu. So he visits the Buddha and he is telling Bhante, previously I am often coming to you, I talk with you, I often meet the other Sangha members, I have long discussions, I often come to the monastery, but now it's very difficult. Every day I have to go through a lot of medication. Now I have a lot of pains in this body, I am now very old. This body is frequently get sick. So he sort of complained to the Buddha. <laughs> so Buddha say, yes, yes. So this body is like that. You can't stop it. So this body is subject to aging. This body is subject to getting old. This body is subject to getting sick. But can you keep the bodily sickness merely to the bodily sickness? <laughs> so that's the instruction Buddha is giving. Can you keep the bodily sickness merely to the bodily sickness? So, actually, when that instruction was given, Nakula Pidu didn't ask a question. What's the question he would have maybe necessary to ask? Bhante, how are you going to do that? <laughs> so that would be a valid question if he could ask, right? But he forgot to ask. <laughs> So on the way back, fortunately, he met Venerable Sariputta. So he tell the whole story to Venerable Sariputta. Pante, I met the Buddha while at the monastery and I mentioned about my situation to him and he gave an instruction. So don't, whenever there is a bodily pain, whenever there is a bodily sickness, so can you keep the bodily sickness merely to the bodily sickness? And then Venerable Sariputta asked the question, didn't you ask from the Buddha that how to, how to do it? So why it is not happening? So that's why Bhante, I asked from you. <laughs> so now he is asking from Venerable Sariputta how to do it. Now, interesting thing is, that is related with the Sakkaya Ditti. Have you heard about the Sakkaya Ditti, the term Sakkaya Ditti? So we have a personality view so we think, okay, this body is myself, this body is I am, or this body belongs to myself, or there is a self inside the body. So likewise, with respect to the body, the materiality, I can have different kinds of identifications. So that is one type of Sakkaya Ditti, one type of uh, personality views. Now similarly to the feelings, again I can have such a relationship. Say, when you are asking a question, how are you doing? I am doing well, I am happy, I am fine. What does it really mean? So the, the feeling you have, the, you know, the comfort you have, or the, say, the how you are feeling, so that you interpret as, ah, I am, I am well, I am good, I am fine. So that's the, in a way, if, if I am truthful, you can simply say, I am fine, even not when you are fine. <laughs> but, but when you are telling the truth, okay, I am fine, or I am not well, so that indicates certain amount of bodily pain, maybe. If you are going through some suffering, you can say, I am not well today. If you feel comfortable, quite happy, oh, yeah, I am doing well today. So you can tell like that. That indicates, I am doing well, I am happy, I am fine. So immediate identification with the bodily comfort or mental happiness with yourself. Did you think about it? So I am happy. So happy happiness is I am. So we immediate direct identification of the feeling as myself. Probably we don't strongly recognize like that, but there's a inherent kind of understanding Acceptance, okay, I am happy. Happiness is I am. I am happy. I am fine. I am not well. I am suffering. So we have a kind of a direct relationship. Either happiness is myself, pleasure is myself, pain is myself, 
or my body is painful. So they are the kind of a possession. So body belongs to me, but now it is suffering. So I am, my body is suffering. I am, my, I, I am going through suffering. So whatever the way we can interpret it, but we have a direct relationship, a direct identification with the pains, with the feelings, even when we are, say, boring. I am bored today. So you are, we are, sometimes we tell, I am bored today, I am feeling unhappy, I am feeling bored. So we tell like that. So the immediate or direct identification with feelings are also there. So how about when we are doing Vedana Nupasana? So we, rather than identifying with the feelings, okay, there is a pleasurable feeling, there is a painful feeling, there is an equanimous feeling. So very much like we, uh, very much like we have separated, we allow feeling to be there, now we step back, step back from the feeling. Let it be pleasurable feeling, okay, let step back, oh, there is a pleasurable feeling. It is not my pleasurable feeling, it is not I am happy, rather there is a pleasurable feeling. Now you can even apply it to your mind, rather than I am happy, oh, there is happiness. And then I am worried, ah, uh, there is a little bit of sorrow. So we are kind of disengaging rather than identifying, rather than holding, rather than personifying. So we disengage the experience. So if we are able to practice Vedananupasana again and again, so this happens quite often. At the beginning it's difficult maybe. Again and again we sometimes when a pleasurable feeling is there we go and hold. When a painful feeling is there I want to get rid of. Even equanimous feeling is there I am bored about it. But when you continue to practice you time to time you become successful. You are able to separate. You are able to maintain a distance looking at it objectively without manipulating it, without trying to control it. You can look at it. Ah, there is a painful feeling. There is a pleasurable feeling. There is an equanimous feeling. Like that. Now, as we are moving forward, now you gain the skill to do that. That means feelings are there, you can observe them. Feelings are there, you can observe them. Now, as you move forward, you can understand, okay, there is a pleasurable feeling. Now, it is arising is there for about five minutes, you are observing it, ah, now it has gone. Okay, there is another painful feeling at another place. You can place your attention there, you can observe it, and probably you may understand, okay, it is there, it was there for five minutes, ah, now it has gone. You are putting it to the correct perspective, looking at them objectively. Similarly, there may be an equanimous feeling. Ah, there is an equanimous feeling. I am observing it. Okay, it has gone. But still, the clear comprehension is not enough. Because whatever the feeling existed for a couple of minutes. But what happened when you are doing it again and again? So our clear comprehension further refines. Our mindfulness sharpens. So when mindfulness sharpens, concentration further refines, it is not, the, the, the feeling does not last for a long time. Rather, you may understand it, it is not a single feeling, it is a group of feelings. Little, little feelings, minute feelings are there. At the beginning, you might, can't see when I am showing this, this has many information, but if you are looking at it very closely, carefully examining it, you can understand a lot of details. So similarly, when our mindfulness is sharpened, concentration is fairly sharpened, then you can understand these little details. So then at that level, so pleasurable feeling has many minute pleasurable feelings. Painful feeling has many minute painful feelings. Equanimous feelings may have many minute equanimous, equanimous feelings. Now, Buddha gave a very interesting simile here. 
Probably you might have noticed how rain drops happen to the kind of a reservoir or to a river, something. So when a rain drop drops to the river surface, what happens? A water bubble pops up. Immediately it will burst. Right? Assume that another, you, another drop, another water bubble pops up, again dro- burst. How about if it is happening quickly now? Many rain drops. So many water bubbles quickly pops up and then breaks. Vedana bubbulu pama. So Buddha mentioned, so feelings are like that. So when you are carefully observing different kinds of feelings, you also may understand, okay, they are very minute kind of feelings, but they quickly arise, quickly disappear, quickly arise, quickly disappear, quickly arise, quickly disappear. Very, very rapid. And at that level, you can't even understand whether it is a pleasurable feeling or equanimous feeling or painful feeling. Doesn't matter. All different kinds of feeling have this kind of a property. They quickly arise, quickly pass away. Quickly arise, quickly pass away. Doesn't matter it is a pleasurable feeling. Doesn't matter it is a painful feeling. Doesn't matter it is an equanimous feeling. So this property is common to all different kinds of feelings. So at that time you, fi- you become somewhat uh, detached from the process. Further detached from the process. So previously we had kind of an attitude, okay, I want pleasurable feelings, I want to hold it, I like it. So you are holding it. Painful feelings, or I don't want it, I want to get rid of it. Equanimous feeling, I am bored about it. So this is the attitude we had. And then later we further changed the attitude, okay, they are painful feelings, they are pleasurable feelings, they are equanimous feelings. Somewhat okay, somewhat advanced in a way. Somewhat separated. Look at them objectively. But at another level, you understand, okay, they are impermanent. Painful feeling is there only for a couple of minutes. Pleasurable feelings are there only for a couple of minutes. Equanimous feelings are there only for a couple of minutes. Another level. At another level, you will understand they are very transient. They may not remain for minutes. They are quickly arising and passing. Quickly arising and passing. Now, I can't even label it. I can't even categorize it whether it is a painful or pleasurable or equanimous. Something is happening, but you can't even name it. You can't even categorize whether it is pleasurable or painful or equanimous. So it is so rapid. By looking at it, so you become more dispassionate. You become more detached now from the process. So likewise you can see as we are progressing, even in Vedana Nupassana, so certain qualities of the mind is developing. So how we are looking at something, how we are able to step back and watch it without trying to control it, manipulate it. And as we are watching it, as we are observing, certain insights are happening through observation. Probably you might have heard about it through someone or probably you might have read about these through books. But the practical experience is the important thing. So you you might definitely have read many books. They may be talking about the impermanence, they may be talking about the unsatisfactoriness, suffering, non-self, all you might have heard, read, but when you yourself observe it directly, so that so the the insights are quite dramatic. It may have a significant influence to our lives. So that's the that is why the practice is utterly important. Because otherwise our knowledge is very superficial. So if we are able to practice, so that practice is proper, actually in a way make even behavioral changes in ourselves. The way you are looking at things, how you even perceive things, so even that might change. So that's why the vipassana practice, satipatthana practice, even though it appears very simple at the beginning, as we continue, so many changes can happen. So that's why Buddha highlights here, Atthanang rakkanto parang rakkati. 
So when you are developing yourself, you are even protecting others. How you are doing it? So here Buddha mentioned, Asevanaya, Bhavanaya, Bahuli Kammena. So you are again and again doing the practice, pursuing, again and again developing further insights. Bahuli Kammena, again and again cultivating. So it's a kind of a continuous practice. Even though you can learn, immediately nothing will happen. So it takes time. We have to have a fair amount of patience. <laughs> so that's the difficult part. <laughs> practice may be interesting, but it takes time. So we need things instantly, isn't it? So I can't wait. I need things quickly. Can I get it quickly? A quick enlightenment? Is there any pill to have it? <laughs> so no shortcuts. So that's the problem. So my teacher Bhante Dhammajiva used to say, the shortcut is longer than the long cut. <laughs> so sometimes we try different things, okay, different techniques, okay, so that expedite the process. But usually not going to work. So the the traditional path is fairly ancient, fairly trustworthy. Shortcuts are sometimes possible, sometimes not possible. There may be certain gifted people, probably you might have heard about them, okay, while listening to a Dhamma sermon they get enlightened, while they are, you know, uh, doing a little thing they get enlightened. So sometimes we also might think, oh, why don't I get enlightened? <laughs> So, in a way, so we need to have a certain amount of skills being developed. Say, for example, if you are practicing for a long time, so you may understand, okay, now the mind has certain skills developed. So, I can maintain my attention for a long time on a particular task now. And my mind has less wandering now. So, it has a certain restraint now. And even when I am keeping my attention, okay, it retains there. I can maintain it for a long time. And whatever the phenomena under the scrutiny, so when they are changing, I can carefully observe it. I can precisely understand it. So these are certain skills. So these skills are necessary to develop in ourselves. So they are to be developed. So they, they may not happen merely by a wish, merely by a chanting. <laughs> merely by uh, a mantra. Rather, you have to develop it. You have to practically involve with it. So that's the hard part. So that's why sometimes people like to wish, sometimes they like to chant, that's why they like to, you know, expect not doing the practical task. That's the problem. So we have to practically sometimes get involved with the teaching. Now, if I ask a little question. Say you have a kid, a child, and you ask your child to be a doctor. Assume that he is just five years old and you are putting a kind of a motivation into him. Okay, but son, you got to be a doctor in the future. And you are wishing, okay, let my son to be a doctor, 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 Will he become a doctor? <laughs> but you, if you understand the practical, you know, practically what I have to teach my son, okay, I have to take him to the school, to the college, to other maybe classes, I have to teach him this, teach him that, certain lessons, probably I have even taken him to a private tuition class. <laughs> If he miss something, okay, I have to help him, I have to guard, I, I have to show the path. So slowly, slowly he may go to the, say, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. Maybe he passed the ordinary level exam, maybe the advanced level. Then he may go to the medical college. Then there's a fair chance he become a doctor. Very practical. 
Same thing here, very practical. So all these qualities, therefore, is not merely happening by mere wish. So you have to work hard. So if we work hard, then slowly we will understand, okay, now there is a certain skill has developed. I didn't have that, but now there is something available in me. My mind was con continuously wandering. Now it has tamed. I can keep it there for a long time. Previously there were many, many thoughts, continuous inner chatter, but now it has reduced. So I have to feel it. You need to experience it. So all these things are very practical. So that's why when Buddha explaining the Satipatthana, he promised certain benefits. So, very straightforward statement that he is in a way defining, or telling us, promising us. Now, as we continue our practice, it has to give me some sort of a happiness where the sorrows, lamentations, crying, all have to reduce. Suppose that you are a person that often cries, even for a little thing. Even, even if your car breaks down, you cry. Even if the little thing happens, you cry. So that might have to change when you continue the practice. So if you are a person, usually become emotional and get into tears, that may have to change. And if you are a person like quickly get angry, that may have to change. If you are a person, uh, say, quickly, impulsively react, that you have to change. It is not that you are forceful about you, but you continue the path, you continue the practice. And after some time you may understand, okay, something has happened, some changes have happened. And probably your wife may sense it, your husband may sense it. Your children even may sense it. They may tell, Mother, you are not scolding me often now. <laughs> Probably they might tell like that. And your colleagues might feel it. Certain changes have happened in yourself. That's why, Soka Paridhavanang Samatikkamai, whatever the sorrows, lamentations will overcome. Dukkha Domanasanang Atthangamai, certain pains, certain, say, despair certain kind of worries that have to reduce. And we need to ask ourselves, if I am practicing for a long time, am I really experiencing these benefits? So these are, say, personal benefits. So when you are not quickly jumping to decisions, when you are not being biased, when you are able to step back and watch a particular situation, it's not only you benefiting, even the others are benefiting. Suppose you are an administrator and you encounter a certain problem. And typically, probably, if you might take the desired party. There may be a party which you like, you prefer. You can take that party and you can take a decision. It may not be the correct decision. It may be a biased decision. But when you are practicing mindfulness, so you may have the capacity to okay, step back, not participate into the situation, not being sort of emotional, not being biased. You can step back and watch the situation. So you have certain patience. You can look at from different angles. So then you can take a decision. So likewise, you yourself will be benefited and others are also benefited. Now, if we look at our emotions, if we move towards Chitta Anupasana. Now, when we are developing Satipatthana, starting with Kaya Anupasana, so we understood, okay, certain skill called mindfulness being developed. I can maintain my attention in the present moment. Good. Not only that, now my mind is concentrated. I can maintain attention, a focused attention onto a particular selected object. Concentration is also developed. Further, I can even look at the details fairly, some little details, even that I can recognize. Clear comprehension also developed. 
So these are prerequisites for Chitta Anupasana. So therefore Buddha does not recommend Chitta Anupasana immediately. You can refer Anapana Satisutta in the Majjimini Kaya. So there Buddha give a kind of a warning. If you are to do Chitta Anupasana, you have to have a fair amount of mindfulness, fair amount of clear comprehension. Otherwise what happened? Typically the thoughts are very tempful. Typically they are, you know, cheaty. And once you are looking at them, easily you get absorbed to them. You get carried away by them. You are driven by the thoughts. But if you know the technique, if you know the art, if you have learned the technique through Kaya Anupasana, through Vedana Anupasana, then you know how to handle it. Like we just discussed, okay, there is a painful feeling, there is an equanimous feeling, there is a pressurable feeling. How about, ah, uh, there is a lustful thought, there is an angry thought, there is a jealousy thought, there is a loving kindness thought, there is a renunciative thought. Can you look at like that? So you can see the same perspective. Oh, there is in-breath, there is out-breath. There is a sensation on the left leg. There is a sensation on the right leg. There is a painful feeling. There is a pleasurable feeling. Similarly, there is a lustful thought. There is an ill-will. There is maybe jealousy. There is a loving-kindness. So they are also looked at objectively. So if you are able to do that, then they will not empower, they will not overwhelm you, they will not absorb you. What would happen to them? They will disappear. Now the interesting thing is, Say bodily phenomena, they are showing same kind of properties. Say feelings, they also say this, show the same kind of properties. Say perceptions, signs, they also show the same kind of properties. And formations, thoughts, intentions, they also show the same kind of properties. They all are impermanent, they all are unsatisfactory, they all are non-governable. They all are having no soul, nothing intrinsically available. So they are all sankhara in a way, all conditioned phenomena. So we might have heard about it, okay, everything is impermanent, everything is suffering, everything is unself, we might have heard about it. But now we are trying to learn through the direct experience. So Satipatthana is in a way a path where we are practically learning the Buddha's teaching. Using our body as a you know, lab in a way to do this experiment, we are using the body as a kind of an instrument. Various feelings as an instrument, as a tool and even thoughts as raw material for our experiment. Ajattangva iti ajattangva kaye kaya nupassi vihirati. Ajattangva kaye vidra nupassi vihirati. Ajattangva chitta nupassi vihirati. So internally. So you are looking at yourself internally. But actually the understanding even grow beyond that. We are using the body as an experiment, as a, as a lab, as a field of uh, our experiment. But the understanding, the insights arising is not limited to that. You can even inferentially apply it to the others. And you may understand, okay, when someone is there, so you can inferentially understand, okay, he is also maybe going through this kind of a feeling. He may be happy. He is not happy. You can guess, you can have a fairly accurate guess. Because you understood about yourself. So more you understand about yourself, you can easily understand another person also. 
the more you understand about your own emotions the more you can understand another's emotion as well but if you are completely ignorant about your own emotions if you are trying to suppress about your emotions then you can't have a precise uh, at least a, a fair understanding of someone else's emotions that's why the, the our selves become a kind of a refuge our body become a refuge feelings become kind of an experiment a tool for us to learn for us to say develop certain spiritual qualities so that's why buddha again and again highlighted atta deepam va bikkave vihirata atta sarana ananya sarana atta deepa bikkave vihirata atta sarana ananya sarana dhamma deepa bikkave vihirata dhamma sarana ananya sarana monks you got to use the body as an island you got to use the body as a refuge there is no any other refuge you have to use the dhamma as a, an island dhamma as a refuge there is no any other refuge so we start with the body so this mundane body physical body to develop certain skills and now we are propagating it to another level to our feelings to understand emotions the more we are able to understand emotions the interesting thing is their power become less and less now i'll give you another simple scenario now suppose uh, before the development of mindfulness before we come to the path to any kind of practical thing suppose you are a person quickly get angry and you get angry and you hit another person you blame the other person but later you regret about it so i was too early and you know it was my fault why did i tell like that have it ever happened <laughs> so we often get you know irregret because we couldn't control our emotions we couldn't control ourselves anger has overwhelmed you so you quickly reacted you shouted but later as you continue the practice develop the mindfulness you at some level you start recognizing the anger but by that time it has grown to very high level you can't control it still you go and hit the person you still you go and you know uh, blame the person but a little change is there you know it you couldn't stop by the way it's it's so powerful you knew it only at a, a higher level you continue to do the practice when you continue to do the practice there's another stage you recognize the emotion you recognize the anger at a lower level it hasn't overwhelmed the mind you are able to notice it at a lower level at that time still the mind burns you know you feel anger you you want to attack the person but you can control now you don't need to attack you know the repercussions you know the consequences so you can control yourself but burning is still there you know you are burning with anger but you didn't shout you didn't hit there's another level so as you are progressing as you are progressing another level you can now understand anger at its very initial stage very initial stage very starting level once you get to that level so burning also reduced so in your mind the inner burning become less and less and there may be a situation you may understand the very first thought of anger so buddha mentioned that in the dhammanupassana level anuppannassa abhyapadda abhyapadassa uppado hoti tancha pajanati there was no anger there was no thought of anger but now you see ah there is an angry thought arising so you can see how beautiful that buddha taking us to different different levels through our own practice so we can't come immediately to that level we have to continue the practice so as we develop the practice there is a time that you can recognize anger as an anger this is a merely angry thought this is merely ill will you don't need to agree to it you don't need to support it you don't need to act according to it you can simply recognize it 
and that mere recognition might be enough to disappear it. Now previously what did we do? So when anger is there, I was practicing loving kindness. Did you? So loving kindness is another technique, right? So I, I can practice loving kindness. It's once you understood, okay, I'm a so kind of an angry character. So better I practice loving kindness. Good, not a bad thing. But now, at this kind of a stage, you can even confront anger. You can understand anger as anger. Ill will, a thought of ill will as thought of ill will. And the mindfulness, clear comprehension, the understanding what you have developed is strong enough to easily fade away the anger. And you don't need loving kindness practice anymore in a way. <laughs> because the whatever the necessary quality is that you are you need to is already available now. So the mind has the capacity to quickly notice the angry thought. And once you notice it, you quickly disengage. So the angry thought weakening and ultimately it will disappear. So this is the beauty. But it will take time. <laughs> I can motivate you, but it will take time. So it's a slow practice in a way, but a guaranteed practice. So that's why I mean, we have to have a lot of weapons. You know that uh, when, if you, once you understand anger to overcome, maybe loving kindness is a useful practice. And once you understand, okay, I'm a lustful character, often a lot of lustful thoughts are coming, Maybe Asubha Bhavana is a useful practice. But as you develop Satipatthana, even a lustful thought, you can recognize at its initial stage. Anupannasa kama chandasa upado hoti thancha pajanati. So Buddha mentioned, okay, there was no lust, uh, now there is a lustful thought arising. So you can even notice it. And once you are able to notice it, that very awareness, that very Say observation may, might be enough to disappear that. Because we, we stop supporting it. We stop being deluded by that. So therefore the thought becomes very much a weak phenomena and it will naturally fade away. So watching the mind is very, very interesting. But as you all know, I mean, we need certain amount of skill to watch the mind. Otherwise, easily we get caught to the thoughts. So that's why we can start with Kaya Nupasana, develop the necessary qualities, skills, and then with that, naturally you may even start watching the mind. And you may even report it. It is not that, uh, that there is a kind of a schedule that I have to practice Kaya Nupasana for one year, I have to practice Vedana Anupasana for another year, then only I can practice Chitta Anupasana. There is no such a hard rule. Slowly you may start watching the mind, you may slowly start recognizing various emotions. It may naturally happen one day. So it's a kind of a natural blossoming of the practice. It is not that we are restricting ourselves. You should be on this, there is no such thing. But easy to start with Kaya Anupasana. And as we develop, we slowly navigate probably to Vedana Anupasana, but definitely to Chitta Anupasana. Even sometimes we can skip Vedana Anupasana, but definitely you will get on to Chitta Anupasana. <laughs> because it's so interesting. So easily you may start watching yourself, understanding various emotions, recognizing various thoughts, how they are arising while maybe walking, while sitting, while talking with another person, you understand about your emotions, about your thoughts. It will definitely happen. So, these are very interesting practices actually available to us, given by the Buddha, taught by the Buddha. So, I invite all of you to engage with it and practically experience the benefits. So, we'll discuss the benefits towards the others tomorrow. And with that, I'll conclude today's Dhamma sermon. Thank you very much for attentive listening. So even today, you were able to practice to the best of our ability and you all have observed Sila and uh, some even donated Dana 
and uh, we practice mindfulness and develop a fair amount of concentration, listen to Dhamma and participate in the Dhamma discussion. Whatever the merits what we have accumulated, we share with all the celestial beings, we share with all the past relatives, and we share with whoever the beings who are in need of merits. And we wish these merits help us also to develop or understand Buddha's teaching, to develop it to the best of our ability and to attain path, fruition, nibbana. We'll recite the traditional verses. Ittavatha cha amhehi sambatam punya sampadang Sambhe deva anumodantu sambha sampatti siddhiya Ittavatha cha amhehi sambatam punya sampadang Sambhe bhuta anumodantu sambha sampatti siddhiya Ittavatha cha amhehi sambatam punya sampadang Sambhe satta anumodantu sambha sampatti siddhiya Aka satta cha bummatha deva naga mahindika Punyantam anumoditva chirang rakhantu sasanam Aka satta cha bummatha deva naga mahindika Punyantam anumoditva chirang rakhantu desanam Aka satta cha bummatha deva naga mahindika Anumoditva chirang rakhantu mamparang Idang vo nyati nang hontu sukita hontu nyato yo Idang vo nyati nang hontu sukita hontu nyato yo Idang vo nyati nang hontu sukita hontu nyato yo Imina punya kammena mame bala samagamo Satang samagamo hotu yava nibbana pattiya Imina punya kammena mame bala samagamo Satang samagamo hotu yava nibbana pattiya Imina punya kammena mame bala samagamo Satang samagamo hotu yava nibbana pattiya Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.